Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Brian Clayton, CEO, co-founder of Green Pile, here on Facebook Live. This month's mentor session here to answer your questions that you guys have submitted. Uh, let's take a look at what we got going on here. First question comes from Zach Nock. His question is, how do you avoid entrepreneurial burnout and what are some things I can do to change up my duties from day to day? Business description and background. I own a security company. We specialize in working with access control cameras, security cameras for both commercial and residential applications. I feel slightly burnt out from all the tasks that I have to do throughout the day, week, sales, invoicing, weekly expenses, reports, meetings, installation of projects and services. I have one morning meditation I try to do to get my mind in the right place as well as mountain bike riding. That's great. <clears throat> It seems as if I have a robot brain or something I want every day to be my honeymoon or something. Ha <laughs> ha. I appreciate your time in answering the question. Okay, so it's a common question. It's a common problem. Entrepreneur burnout trying to uh, just trying to stay motivated and, and trying to figure out ways to to keep driving forward. I think like I'll answer your question two ways. First, I'll answer it from like a psychological standpoint, like a big picture standpoint. I think to, to be successful in business and to get your business to a million dollars in revenue, $5 million in revenue, $10 million in revenue, I think you have to have some sort of monotical, like relentless desire to make something of yourself in business. I think in order to get to those milestones, you, you, you have to almost, you almost, almost have to like have joy in the process and you almost have to like get really fired up about what your goals are and really fired up about what the next uh, set of milestones are and like accomplishing that and, and taking pride and joy from that is what gets you through the day to day grind. Like, yeah, nobody likes to go in and do expense reports and nobody likes to do cold calling and nobody likes to do all of the, all of the day to day stuff it takes to run a successful business. But if you are really just gassed up about hitting your goals for this year, then that stuff kind of fades away and you realize it's just it's just part of it. So that's the first thing I would do. I would really try to really, uh, if I were in your shoes, I would really reevaluate my business, the pride I take in my business, uh, like the joy and satisfaction I get around its growth um, and and also my team members, you know, what, what I'm able to do for them in terms of the business growing and helping them in their lives what it's able to do for me and my family. Like I would really key in on those things and get fired up about those things. And then that'll get you through a lot of the day to day grind. So that's a, that's a big picture answer to your question. And then practically like in the trenches, uh, the first thing I would do is I would recommend you read the book, the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. If you haven't read it already, it's a book about how you create systems and, de and delegate a lot of these things out. I think that can help you. Um, <clears throat> You really got to look at creating an org chart for your business. And so like there's like a head of operations, head of finance, head of marketing, head of HR, head of uh, budgeting, all of these things. And it's your name on probably all of these roles. But over as time goes by, you need to look at how you're going to peel your name off these roles and, and start to outsource these things to employees or freelancers or contractors. That will help you not only like menta mentally get through a lot of the of the day to day grind, but also like build an actual business with people and systems in place. You really have to look at how you can replace yourself in every one of these functions that you're doing and how you can create a routine and a process and a system to delegate it out to an employee or a freelancer. Um, so take, for example, like let's just say uh, an hour of your day every day is, is goes into uh, expense reports and you're really you're really just, uh, you know, bean counting and you're, and you're going through these expense reports and you're trying to match everything up and all that. Like next time you're doing that, really focus on how can I replace myself and get somebody else to do this? And how can I map out the process? Okay, here's the first thing you do. Here's the second thing you do. Here's, here's what, and, 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 and then you can hire like a virtual assistant to do this stuff. Upwork.com is a great place to, to find this type of talent uh, that can help you with these things. And and uh, the last point I'll leave you with is that there's a big difference between hard work and difficult work. What you're describing is hard work. You're coming in every day. You're working your ass off. You're beating yourself up. 
uh, you're probably putting in 50, 60, 70, 80 hour weeks. And that's hard work. And you should be applauded for that. But difficult work is even more hard. Uh, difficult work is coming in on Sunday and just picking out one of these things you mentioned and building a system to where you can delegate that to somebody. And that might take you, uh, that might take you longer than just actually doing it yourself. But if you can do that and, and invest time in building, building that system, then a lot of these things will over time over a year, two, three years will, will develop, will, will melt away because you've got a team around you. So I hope that helps. Next question. It comes from Kyle Stroud. I'm looking to hire someone to monitor inventory levels and make purchasing decisions. Should I use cheap out of country employees, friends, family, job search sites, etc.? I'm an Amazon seller. I purchase products at wholesale prices and ship the products to Amazon warehouses, which then fulfill orders to my customers. After speaking to Sean, I know that I need to hire someone to do the work that I don't enjoy. Inventory needs to be monitored daily and employees will need to use tools and my past sales performance on these products to make an educated guess on how many units would need to be purchased. This is a critical part of the business. I have no inventory stock. I can't, if I can't make money. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm always a fan. Uh, first of all, never, I, I would not recommend hiring a friend or a family member for this job. I would try, is it, I would try to delegate it out to a remote worker and, and make that work first before I tried it hiring a full-time employee to come in in-house, uh, you know, in my office or, or locally, I would try to, I would try to get on like upwork.com and I would try to hire a virtual assistant to do a lot of this stuff. I, it sounds like a lot of this stuff is bean counting and it can be delegated out. I would, uh, what I would do is, is I would take, a week or two and I would map out every single thing I'm doing. I would use loom loom.com uh, to record my screens and uh, make a, a screen, a screen share of everything that I'm doing. And while I'm talking, explaining like, I, like literally like while you're doing it, it's like, okay, here's how I do this. And here's how I make sure that this goes right. And I would create like hours of loom videos. And then, and then I would, I would funnel that down into a, a, a system in which that I could hand off to a virtual worker and you don't have to go with the cheapest. I mean, you can hire, uh, you can hire remote workers in the United States for probably 25, $30 an hour, or you can hire somebody in the Philippines who's probably just as good for $10 an hour. So you might experiment with both, but what I would do is, is I would have them do the 80 or 90% of the, of the manual, uh, grind. Uh, and then that would tee up, you to make like the high leverage decisions because you mentioned here in, in your description that there there's like some 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 like inventory purchasing calls that need to be made and like some 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 decision making that needs to be done i wouldn't outsource that right off the bat because if, if they get that wrong it can it can spell doom for your business but a lot of the bean counting like all of the stuff that can be that can be done by somebody else i would create a i would create such a good description of what needs to be done with videos and screen sharing that like an eight year old can do it. And then you can hire somebody out of the Philippines or, or somebody out of Latin America or, or in, in the Middle East uh, for half of what it would cost in, in the United States. And also they, they tend to be more loyal workers. They tend to stick with you a lot longer. That would be how I would, how I would uh, approach it. And again, uh, I would also recommend the E Myth because that—that's exactly what that book talks about. It's a, it talks about creating processes and, and systems in which you can delegate out to somebody else. Step one: read the E Myth if you haven't, or listen to it on Audible or or YouTube. Next question comes from Allison Koyan Koyananji. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. How do you deal with employees lying to you? 
It's another question. Uh, let's see, business description background. It's another question. My other one wasn't answered yet. Hope it, this is okay. <clears throat> Yesterday I found out that something, someone who works for me has been lying to me and she's been doing about what work she's been doing and using company time to do other work that has nothing to do with the tasks I signed to her. She also went against the confidentiality agreement she signed by using techniques and strategies I taught her for our agency's work, uh, for other work she's been doing and lying about. Wondering how you've dealt with situations like this and how I should approach the situation. It's tough, tough, tough question. Step one, um, you've got a bigger problem than than your employee lying to you. Uh, it's, it sounds like you don't have the interests aligned in terms of what the expectations are for her role and, 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 and what her goals are. And it sounds like you're having to micromanage her, which is, which is common. I mean, it's something that we all deal with. So step one, take a step back and try to figure out how do you create an environment in which all everybody's interests are aligned. There's no reason why they should be uh, dicking around on Facebook and Instagram all day because they got to get work done. Um, there's no reason why they should be doing other people's work on company time because they got to get your work done. There's no reason why they should be lying to you because they're on the same team with you. Like, so that's the, that's really the problem. Like the lying and the dicking around at work and doing like playing on Instagram while they're on, on the clock is a symptom of the bigger problem, which is you don't have everybody's incentives aligned. So you really if you don't solve that, you're going to be banging your head against the wall on this problem for as long as you own this business, because it's just human nature. People are only going to do the bare minimum work they have to do. They're always going to be looking out for their own self-interest. They're not going to give a shit about your business or what your needs are. It's always going to be that way until you can create an environment in which um, they, they want to win because you want to win and everybody wins. And so, yeah, let me, let me, let me look at what your business description was one second. Digital market agency. Okay. So, so let's say you're paying this person, I'm guessing you're paying them by the hour. You're paying them 20, $30 an hour and, and you're, and you're running a digital marketing marketing agency. Ideally, you need to align all of the incentives around pay and production and output as the same as you as the owner as as for them. So so this person would come in and work on a, an account, work on a project. They would get paid based on the amount of money that the client makes or they would get paid based on the amount of mile uh, 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 whatever the KPIs are for whatever it is you're trying to do for the client. So let's just say you're running a a Facebook campaign for the client and their budget is $5,000 a month. And, um, you're trying to get them, uh, 50 customers. Like they would get paid based on those milestones and not just paid by the hour. If you can't really figure out how to incentivize the pay structure based on the outcome and, and the production, then you're always going to be banging your head against the wall in terms of dishonesty, in terms of people, not necessarily dishonesty because not everybody's dishonest, but people just really just just optimizing for their own their own benefit and not the company's benefit. Uh, so first off, really do the difficult work of solving that problem rather than just being ticked off because somebody is being dishonest to you because that's always going to happen. It will never go away. That that you will always have that problem. The second thing is about what to do with this uh, particular person. You know. You might approach them and just be completely candid with them and say, hey, listen, you know, I like working with you. You've been here nine months. I feel like, you know, you're you're doing a good job for us. We appreciate everything you do. I just want to let you know there's going to be some changes in how we're going to do pay structure moving forward. And so that's coming. But in the short run, you know, uh, when, uh, you, you lied about this one thing. And when you lied about it, it kind of made me feel like crap because I feel like I've done good to you. And so, um, you know, I, don't, I appreciate if you wouldn't do that again. Um, I feel like I've been honest with you. I feel like I, I would appreciate if you would always be honest with me. So, like, let's put that aside and, like, let's not do that anymore. And then 
um, I just want to let you know that we're going to be changing how we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing pay pay structure moving forward. We're going to move your hourly rate down to this, but you're going to be paid based on X, Y, and Z. So you're actually going to get to be able to make more money and maybe even work less hours. It just depends on how hard you want to work. That would be how I would approach this. I wouldn't just necessarily like fire them right off the bat, but if it happens again, then I, then I would get rid of them and I would set that expectation. Like, look, if 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 you if you break my trust again, I'm going going to have to let you go. And then I would create some sort of documentation around that. Um, uh, I, you know, you can you can call it a PIP, a performance improvement program, something in writing. So when you do fire them, that it doesn't come back to haunt you that you you've documented that this happened. Uh, so that's how I would approach that. Next question, and it's the last question. That's that. Uh, I was just getting on a roll. Okay, let's see. This question comes from Lindsay Grifka. How can I get the attention of the buyer after I have received their personal email or purchasing team email? from a cold call to the dispensary. Background. I've been calling dispensaries and have been getting personal emails or buying team emails from Bud Tinder. I'm currently writing an email to them as soon as I hang up. It reads, hi, I just spoke with Bud Tinder's name. After my new line of cannabis storage accessories and grinders, they are really taken off. He, she recommended I email you, schedule a call. When are you free to chat a bit about my innovative line? The subject is either X, Y, and Z. All of the dispensaries have been emailed three times, but, but those emails go to general inbox. Thank you. Elevator pitch at Bling Blunts. We break stereotypes and promote self-expression and confidence by offering innovative and chic personal storage containers that are high fashion, functional and discreet. Okay. So basically your question is around how do you, how do you craft this, this email that you're cold emailing people? And, uh, there, you know, there's a world of, of information in terms of copywriting and how you can really, punch up the value on what it is you're emailing these people about. The first thing I would really, really try to focus on is what is your value proposition? And your value proposition is if I'm your ideal customer, why would I do business with you versus anybody else? And so it, you really have to like dial into that. And, and so the answer to that question is not necessarily like oh uh, we have an innovative line that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it does. It, it it can't mean uh, our stuff's taking off. It's really taking off. That doesn't mean anything to me. Like why do I care? You have to really dial into that. Like what is what is the thing that you're doing and offering me as a recipient of this email that I can't get anywhere else. And so the value you get to really like focus and work on what your value proposition is to your to your customer. I'm assuming these are uh, these are dispensaries. So these would be like retailers of your of your of your product. And so you really got to like put yourself in their shoes. Like why would they care about your line? Well, they want to make money. So how are you going to make them get them to make money? And so it's like 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 take for example five hour energy drink. Five hour energy drink, their value proposition was not that this thing gets you like jacked up for five hours. Their value proposition was okay, small uh, gas station retailer, you can make an extra thousand dollars a week with no extra space being taken up in your store. You've got this little thing; it's high margin. Um, it, it takes up no space. It's right there by the, the checkout cash uh, register. And you can you can literally increase sales by 5% at each store with not having to cannibalize any any room in your in your floor. That's value proposition to their end customer. Now, now there's also a value proposition to the person drinking the drink and, and, and in your case, like carrying the uh, the container. 
but really this email is going to the person you want to retail this product and so you have to get in their shoes and figure out why would they even care about your product and and things like it's innovative or it's taking off is not value proposition proposition it's i have a product line that can make you x y and z more money without having to take cannibalize any of your other product lines and it's unlike anything else you ever have that that, that you have on your shop floor um and, and here's some pictures of it and here and here's some testimonials from other shop owners about how much they've made and and you know like really trying to understand what would cause them to say yes the other thing i would do is, is i would if you have any customers that are carrying this line i would really try to like get in their shoes and 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 try to figure out why they said yes and try to figure out why they uh, why they are carrying it and what value they're getting from it and, and trying to document that into a case study and, and using that evidence to, to showcase to other people in an in email because like you've got like three seconds of attention. These people are running stores. They're, they're, they're running stores in the cannabis industry. It's a tough industry. Um, they're just deleting emails the minute they're going through them. It doesn't matter how many times you email them. And, 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 and in fact, if you email them too many times, you'll get too many spam complaints and, and then all your emails will go to spam. So I would really try to do that. And then, and then the next thing I would do is I would take a course on copywriting. Um, if, if you just go to YouTube and, 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 uh, type in copywriting course, Brian Dean, B R I A N Dean. He's, he's a really good copywriter um, and, and you'll get a real good sense like you need to get like you need to spend over the next month you need to spend five to ten hours learning how to write copy uh, if you're going to try to sell this product through cold email outreach you need to be a decent copywriter and and you might think well I'm not in the copywriting business yes you are and you need, and if you can't really figure out how to figure out what words to use that 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 moves that product, then you're going to be beating your head against the wall trying to uh, trying to develop these relationships over cold email outreach. So, so step one, work on your value proposition. Why? If and again, value proposition. If I am your ideal customer, meaning if I'm a shop that could sell this product, why am I going to do business with you over anybody else? And then the answer is because. X, Y, and Z and innovative and it's really taking off and it looks pretty are not the answers. It's something else and you got to figure out what that is. And then work on your copywriting chops. Uh, and then I would also, after I, after I really got this email, uh, figured out and like the best that I could do it, meaning you, I would get on upwork.com and I would hire, a. uh, an expensive copywriter that makes like a hundred or two hundred dollars an hour to take a look at it and to give me some more suggestions, and then I would uh, re-engage my campaign. And then after that, I would then test. I would test uh, variations of of the copy, uh, maybe a little sl slight tweak in the value proposition to figure out what is working better than the other one. Uh, but that, but that's that's after you do all this other stuff. Hope that helps. Okay, everybody, that's all the questions for this month. Hope this helped. Uh, see you guys next month. Everybody have a great day, and everybody keep kicking butts on your business. Talk to you later.